Hello and welcome back to Sharks Happen. My name is Hal and I am your host. Today we are going to do a special. Um, I'm just going to talk to you. We're going to have a podcast type thing, a conversation basically. I got a little bit of taglines here. These are myths and some trends that I've noticed since we've started doing this show. We've gone through almost 700 attacks on the show. Uh, there's 140 videos out there of attacks. And uh, about six of them are single attacks. So there's 130 something full episodes where we go through the, the attacks, mostly large sharks, some small sharks. And now we're gonna go over things that I've noticed, things that we've been told that I believed at one point that I don't believe anymore after I looked into it, after I've done all these attacks. I'm about a thousand in, I'm a few hundred ahead of us for when we go into the show. So today we're gonna go through that at the end of the show, I'm going to go ahead, uh, I'm heading down to Georgia to do a little bit of fishing, a little bit of golfing for a week, so I'll fill you in on a little story from the last time I was fishing down there. Um, just another one of my stories that we'll have to go over, so stick around for that. Now we're going to get started. The first myth, this just the first point on here, sharks are always out to eat. Uh, no, they're not always out to eat. Sharks uh, swim around. They sit there and watch people on their surfboards and on their in their boats and what they're doing they it looks like they might play some people have asked do they play and i'm like i don't know but then i saw a malibu artist video on a great white that was kind of scratching its back with kelp or maybe even playing with the kelp that was floating on top of the water uh, and then we have jd morgan i think he's a marine biologist that was down in the key west he was in key west and a 11 foot great white came up and took his took his spear gun right out of his hand and almost took his left thumb off of him too uh, they had to sew that back on but it took a spear gun and took it about 50 feet away from him, just dropped it and just kept swimming. So it just came by, took a spear gun, almost his thumb, and dropped it about 50 feet away. So uh, maybe they do play. Um, some of these attacks on boats and uh, kayaks and, and surfboards, maybe it's a playful thing. I think it's more a territorial thing, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So the sharks, most of the time when they're biting people, and we're talking our large sharks. All these are large sharks, not dogfish. We don't do dogfish here. So when they bite the people, it's mostly territorial. And by territorial, it is not a home territorial, like home turf. It's where, you're, where that shark is at that time and does it want you out of that area. And I think that most attacks are for that reason. They see you there, they want you out of the area, especially with the dangerous sharks that we deal with. Um, Bull sharks and, and tiger sharks are, are hard to put their finger on, but bull sharks are going to surprise you a little bit, what we get into a little bit later on them. Uh, but right now, you know, sharks are not always out to eat. A lot of their bites are because they don't want you in their area. Um, some people startle them when they jump in the water, like Thaddeus Kabinski that jumped in the water and uh, the young lady that jumped off of her boat and the husband said that the splash that was made was way louder, you know, bigger than what she should have made. And it sounded like she jumped right on the shark. Uh, we had a tiger shark that somebody jumped on and he got bit four or five times. Uh, those are multiple bite situations when, they, when you land on them sharks. I've covered a couple of them and both times those sharks went off off on those people and it's understandable um, it wasn't a feeding thing it was just biting them a lot of times so a territorial type attack not a feeding type attack in that situation where you jump on the shark or you startle the shark that is Kabinsky was bitten once in the chest a huge bite from about a 13 foot bull shark when he jumped into his canal right after he heard some splashing um, if you've ever watched sharks or watched fish try to avoid sharks that battle lasts you know the little I think they're little bonnet heads that chase them at night in my sister's canal down there and uh, it could last 10 minutes you, you'll, you'll see a ruckus for a couple minutes and you'll actually see fish's bodies you know small fish but they will tumble at the top of the water and all of a sudden it stops and two minutes later you hear it again for a little bit and a couple minutes later it could be different fish but it's a lot of commotion and it there it could have intermittent five minutes of quiet time in between when they're fighting these things and chasing them around the water so you don't know what going on there but sharks are not always out to eat even the large sharks that we deal with um, the problem is is that uh, a lot of these um, let's just say non-lethal shark bites are 
you know, sharks that are out to eat that end up seeing your foot instead or seeing a hand instead and they bite it. So those are accidents, we'll get into those later. So that's the first one. Sharks are not always out to eat. Uh, we'll get into the next one. Blood in the water is a trigger for sharks to attack. It is not. Um, it's an attractant, it's gonna make them curious, but it's not gonna, you know, make them wanna bite you. I, it's not gonna happen. They, they swim away from people that are bleeding all the time. And, uh, you know, surfers can account for that. I mean, they've been bitten all the time and, you know, shark just usually bites once, shakes them and leaves, or they miss them, get the board, shakes it and leaves. Um, that's what they do. They're getting, they want them out of the area and that's why they're attacking. They're not attacking to feed, they're attacking because they don't want them in their water and they usually get what they want after they bite. So it's pretty effective. Eric Ritter standing with the bull sharks and all those bull sharks swim behind him. He's talking to the other guy. They have a cameraman. It's probably, probably in a little bit shallower water and they're not in deep water anyway, maybe two feet of water, two and a half feet of water, just enough to cover your calf, unfortunately for Eric Ritter. Uh, but that eight, nine foot bull shark that came through and bit him, tore that piece of calf off, it didn't bother him and none of the other sharks went to go hop on the train as soon as blood was in the water. It was not something that riled them up or made them crazy or started a, a feeding frenzy. Um, it can do that. I mean, if he would have stood there and we would have seen what the sharks would have ended up doing, but they got him out of the water pretty quickly. But there's another case, um, the, the jackass that jumped into the middle of the sharks for shark week. Um, I actually did watch that clip and uh, he was bitten, he, he landed on the sharks. I mean, there was a lot of sharks in the water where he was landing. I didn't think there'd be that many. So he was bound to get bit. I was shocked that he didn't get bit worse. A shark came up and bit him, I think, in the leg. Could have been the arm, no, but I think it was the leg. And uh, you can see the shark bite him and then that shark swims off. It's not sticking around, and they're smaller sharks. They're not sharks that will attack people. But even though he's in the water bleeding and there's other people in the water, there's sharks all around him, none of them are bothering any of them. And, uh, you know, there's a couple other cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, the gentleman that was bitten before Heather Boswell, bitten in his leg, he's bleeding. Uh, he hit the shark in the nose and the shark went off, but the shark could have decided that it wanted him and it didn't. It let him go and it went and it cut off Heather and ended up taking her leg in that situation there. Uh, so there's some cases, and, and the biggest case is the reef, the attacks that inspired the reef. Uh, Ray Boundy, um, sitting there, his, his boat goes down, he's the first one bitten, he's bitten in the leg. Um, so he's bleeding the whole time, and the shark comes back and takes the other two that are with him, and he survives. So blood in the water is not going to uh, trigger an attack. Um, what's going to trigger an attack is your splashing, your movements. And uh, even if underwater, I think if you're doing too much frantic like moving, you'll probably send off some, some pressurization that, that mimics a wounded animal that they, that they hunt. Same thing, it's especially true when you're on the surface. You start splashing on the surface, they're gonna start thinking that you're injured. That will trigger an attack. The blood in the water is not necessarily gonna do it, but you start splashing and acting all a fool because you saw a shark, you're probably letting it know that, hey, I'm injured and it might take advantage of that situation even though it wouldn't. Um, possibly if you kind of kept calm, kept your hands under the water, you know, nice fluid. Hardest thing is keep calm. I mean, I don't know how people do it. And every time I hear about keep calm, one name hits my mind and that's David R. Miles, man. The guy that gets swimming up to the surface, he's looking around admiring the, you know, what he's swimming up from at the, around the water and he swims right into the head of that shark. <laughs> no way. So, but he kept cool and, and it's probably good for him because if he'd have struggled, it might have been the same thing. Told the shark he was injured and he might have been bitten. And if he'd have been bitten uh, the first or the second time, whether it was when his head, was in, head and shoulders were in the shark's mouth or when the shark took him underneath his shoulder blades into his mouth, uh, either way, he would have been done. I mean, that would have been a bad move and somehow uh, he kept cool. Rodney Fox keeps cool. These guys are just amazing that they can do that, but I guess that probably has to do with you going into the water and being aware that you're around such animals and such things could take place. Um, I always think that, you know, I don't go into the water like that, especially to dive or anything where you will end up by them. And I always think, well, you know, they probably uh, never think about it so that they don't freak themselves out. But 
you know, the more stories I go through of attacks on them, the survivors like the Rodney Fox, the David Miles, it makes me think that they do think about it and that they maybe unconsciously prepare themselves in case something happens. Much more than someone like me who would want to give up the ghost like a weasel and Roger Rabbit. So, the last one, and these ones are all sharks basically. This is not just, um, not just, you know, a great white or anything. This is just all sharks and it's rogue sharks. Uh, I haven't seen rogue sharks yet. I, these people, uh, I see it on Shark Week way too much. Oh, there was an attack the same day two years ago. Do you think it was the same shark? Uh, that breaks my brain. Just completely splits it in half and, and I'm like, what? <laughs> now these sharks know the date that they attack somebody and they come back if you listen to some of these people. Problem I have with rogue sharks is uh, how many people a shark would have to eat. You take an eight-foot bull shark. If it just wants to eat humans, let's say this rogue shark thing happens and an eight-foot bull shark decides it wants to eat humans, a human's going to be eaten once every week, once every two weeks at the most. So you're going to have these predations jumping from three, two, three, four a year. They're going to jump up into the teens, 20s. Um, it'll be outrageous and you'll be able to notice it. And that's just one eight foot bull shark. You get one of these large tigers or a, or a great white and these things decide that they want to eat people, forget about it. You, if, just forget about it because they eat hundreds of pounds when they want to fill themselves up. And a large great white can eat, you know, 500 pounds with no problem. And a little 200 pound person like me, I mean, gone. It probably swallow me whole. And I've run into an 18, 18 foot tiger shark, 18 foot Great white definitely can swallow you whole. Um, they're not going to swallow you in one piece. You're going to be bitten on the way in. We've seen that in our attacks, unfortunately. Uh, but they will swallow you whole. That's how they prefer to eat their food. And that Malta great white that was caught, I think it's one of the biggest sharks I've ever seen. Um, they found an eight-foot blue shark, a six-foot dolphin, and part of a sea turtle in that shark all at the same time. So they eat a lot. So one of those sharks starts eating people. You're talking about a person disappearing every few days. That would be noticeable. Rogue sharks do not happen. Closest thing to a rogue shark, I think, would be that trap shark that basically swam itself up into that river over in Matawan and ended up attacking three people, two of them being fatal, uh, one predation. The other one could be an attempt to predate, you don't know. Um, just took his thigh, Stanley Fisher, I believe his name was Stanley Fisher, took his thigh and uh, he ended up passing away. But there was a train delay and he might have actually survived that attack if there wasn't a two hour train delay on that situation. So uh, rogue shark's not a thing. Now, we wanna get into the great white and some myths about the great white. And the first one we're gonna start off with is bite and wait. Bite and wait is not a thing. It's something that I thought was real and it's not. I've been through a thousand attacks, probably 30, 40 on surfers. They bite and they wait and they wait and they wait. There's no return. And if they are hungry and they attack the surfer, now this has happened where other people came out, put them on their board, they attacked a person and they keep going. The shark's going to keep attacking that person on the way in. We've, we've had it. They swim underneath the people's legs. They would stop their legs. There were six people that were taking a guy in on a raft. And the shark would keep swimming and keep biting at the guy. So they would stop their legs from moving and all just hang there while the shark was underneath them. And then they'd start swimming again once it got around there. But it kept coming back and biting. That's not bite and wait. That shark wanted to eat. And uh, you'll know if a shark wants to eat. It's a much different attack than any of these territorial attacks. It's as brutal as some of the some of the uh, ter ter uh, feeding events. Lewis Boren, that was a brutal attack. The, the decapitated divers we went over, those are brutal attacks, but I'm not sure that those are feeding events. Some people say that maybe they thought that they were uh, seals being in their suits and they were gonna feed, plus seals are in the area, and some of them, and that's a possibility. I can't say it's not, I don't think for the shark. I think it's most likely that the shark didn't want them in the area because there was no consummation of the body. Uh, let alone the parts in some cases that it bit off. So, um, you know, uh, the bite and wait, what I see, and what everybody calls bite and wait, see Lewis Bourne is one of those bite and waits that waited forever. It bites and just waits and waits and waits. 
it never comes back. And this happens often. A person is bitten by a shark, and if they don't get out of the water, and they're, they can sit in there overnight and be picked up the next day, and all that happened was they were bit that one time. And it does happen. So uh, bite and wait doesn't happen. Uh, there's bite and circle. We've seen that in stories with, with surfers and swimmers. It bites you, and then it goes off, and it goes off a distance and starts circling. In that case, you are in trouble because I think it's more likely that shark's coming in for one more hit before it takes off, once it starts circling. Now, an odd one, and I think we covered this maybe about two months ago or so. Well, maybe it's three months ago now. I haven't done a show in a month. So the shark came in and bit this guy, total territorial attack, and then swam off, kind of like with uh, um, the diver J.D. Morgan will get into later down in the Keys, but the shark swam off about 50 feet, turned around and swam right back at him, bit him again, and then it left. These sharks get pissed off, and that's the situation with a lot of these territorials. They are pissed, and you end up with a Lewis Bore in the single bite. You end up with, uh, you know, decapitated divers single bites. It depends on how mad that shark is that you were in that water, in my opinion. I, can it be mistaken identity? Sure. I'm going to put that possibility out there. I think it's more likely what I'm saying that it's territorial in nature. So uh, when I see bite and wait, what people call it, it's the same thing you're watching when you're looking at every one of those drone videos that are all the same with sharks sitting there and looking at the person. That's all the shark did. It came in, it bit the person and went back to its natural state, its natural curiosity of the situation. And in some cases, those sharks follow them in and some people say, oh, because it wanted to eat them. No, because it wanted to make sure it's out of the water, what it, what it wanted in the first place, and they'll make sure of it. So uh, bite and wait, I, I haven't seen it yet because I haven't seen a shark return um, when somebody's injured and, and do them in. If, if a shark is hungry, they're not waiting on nothing. Our sharks, large sharks. So that's it for the bite and wait. Now, mistaken ID happens often. And uh, people give this one to the great white a lot, and I can't believe that they, they try to do that with the great white. The thing has the best senses of any shark out there, and its brain is massive compared to the sharks that they study, these little dogfish. So uh, the great white with this, with this whole uh, mistaken ID, they know that what we are. I mean, the things, if you haven't noticed, the ocean is huge. The ocean is monstrous. They say there's not very many of these sharks, yet they're always in the shallows where we're at. And they're always in there at the times that we're there. Um, so that means that the sharks hang out and hunt where we hang out and swim and surf. And you're gonna have these interactions with these things. So these sharks, even when they're little, they're, 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 they're nursed in these areas. You see them all the time over in California looking at these surfers and the people in the water. These sharks have seen us a ton by the time they're big sharks. So uh, I, don't, I don't think they mistake us for anything. Number one, they can smell, so we don't smell like their food. Number two, they have pressurized the lateral line that can pick up pressure movements. And we don't move like anything else in the water. We, we must put off, a, unless we're splashing around at the top of the water, we probably put off a whole different set of uh, pressure differences than anything that they hunt. We don't move like anything that they, everything that they hunt moves either smoother than us or you know, like a fish all, all erratic. We, have, we must have our own distinct, I'm thinking, uh, give off as far as the motion that they pick up and the differences of the pressure. So they have that going for them. They have eyes and I don't buy that they can't see. They pop their heads out of the water and spy hop. They're probably the best visual sharks that there are. That's my opinion. And then, uh, you know, all this, oh, uh, they, they can't see very far. That's insane. Yet they can see that you're a, you're a seal, but we'll get into seals and sea lions and everything else. But mistaken ID does not happen. What happens is accidental bites. And for our large sharks, we're gonna talk about two separate things now. We're gonna talk about the Florida bites shark attack capital of the world uh, and uh, the thing is is those sharks they're mostly black tips and those spinners and they're smaller sharks they don't care to eat people and it's proven out by all the one bite uh, bites there most of them are one bite on the person it's kind of rare for those sharks to bite you twice because they bit you once and it's not 
mistaken ID, it's an accident. They're in there chasing fish while you're in there doing whatever you're doing, whether you're laying on a board, splashing around, and they see your hand or your, or your foot, they see something, they're chasing a fish by, and they see something and they grab it. That's an accident on that shark's part because it's hunting that fish and it grabs you because you're there. That's not a mistaken idea. It didn't look at that in a fraction of a second and say, that's a fish and bite you. No, it just bit you because you were there. That's an accident. That's not mistaken ID. So mistaken ID overall is overblown and it's a big myth. Um, mistaken ID with, with large sharks is, is very rare and I would, I would say that it's mostly accidental bites. A uh, woman was swimming with dolphins when she was bitten. You're swimming with their food, you're bitten. Uh, there's been a couple of people bitten sw swimming with them. Uh, even Henry Boris had his leg bitten when he was swimming around a bunch of seals. But these damn seals were, were hanging out as the shark was swallowing his leg at the bottom of the water. And then it came back up for him. It was only his other fellow spear fishermen because he was down there just taking photos. His fellow spear fishermen are the ones that fended that shark off the second time. Wasn't even interested in the seals. No way that's mistaken identity. That shark decided it wanted to eat Henry Boris's what's in my mind. And I think I have that down as an attempt to predate. Now we get into sharks are afraid to be hit, especially these guys. You know, people think, I think that people think because they come up from behind that and they don't want you to see them that they're afraid that you're going to be able to hit them. They don't care. You see these little ampullae that we're told are so sensitive? How can they hit boats with that? How can they blast kayaks with that? How can they blast sea lions with that that weigh thousands of pounds? They wouldn't be able to if it's as sensitive as they say. So hitting a shark, I don't think ever, uh, a great white, a large one like that, I don't think it ever is effective to get the shark to let you go. Um, I think poking it in the eye is effective. I think that guy that grabbed onto the gills and pulled on them, that's effective. I don't think hitting it anywhere in the snout is gonna help you. All you're gonna do is, uh, be more likely to get that hand inside of there and you'll be in trouble. Um, at that point, once you're being bitten like that, when you're, when you're punching on the shark, it doesn't matter. Now it's up to the shark. Is it feeding or is it mad? If it's just mad, you might be okay. If it's feeding, you're done. We've seen that. We've seen it too many times. So um, they're not afraid to be hit. They come up behind because they hunt seals. And these seals, believe it or not, one out of two get away from these guys. <laughs> With them sneaking up behind them, and I think waiting purposely for their heads to be above the water, because they spy hop, they know how hard it is to see back down in the water, and they do, wait, they do attack people that are diving at the surface. And I think that's because they know you can't see in the water as well when your head is above it. They attack them from behind, head above the water, and one out of two get away. And that is why it doesn't want to be seen. Once it's seen by one of those seals, that 50% that probably drops to like a 10% success rate for this guy. Once it's seen, it, they, can, they can start jumping and evading. So it waits, it comes from behind where it knows it isn't seen. When its head's above the water, that's when I see most of them attack. This is a smart, smart fish right here. So, uh, you know, they're not afraid to be hit. And uh, no other sharks are afraid to be hit that I know of as far as when you're fighting them. Uh, we had the one guy that stood there, he was standing in about, I think it was like four feet of, five feet of water, four feet of water, and he was, he had that tiger shark, and I think it was nine foot tiger shark if I remember correctly, and he said that he was boxing it. He's from another country, and it, uh, when you read it, it's in his, uh, you know, kind of dialect. But he says that he was given shots and the shark is biting off pieces of his arm. I think it bit his chest. And he's sitting there boxing that shark, not afraid. Uh, these little six, seven foot sharks. Seven foot shark, uh, first name, who, who is that? Uh, Bergstaller. Frederick Bergstaller gets attacked in four feet of water by a seven foot bull shark. And he's trying to fight it off and trying to run away from it, doing everything he can. And this shark ended up piecing him out right there, taking his leg, taking his arm. Nobody was going to go out there and mess with him. So he ended up a fatality from one. And then I think the other name uh, starts with Johans. I can't remember the last name. Uh, might start with a J. He's trying to get himself to the shore. That shark was able to drag him out into the deep water where the onlookers saw two other uh, dorsal fins 
converge on him. They found him in three different places. They recovered his body in three different places in that area. So uh, yeah, these sharks are not afraid of you. I mean, that's why I say you are more afraid of the, the sharks than they are of you. We're talking large sharks. Little sharks, we don't talk, we don't, that's not our concern. We'll leave that to the experts. We deal with large sharks only, the ones that you really got to worry about to be able to live. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Uh, if you can find two, uh, two fatalities from sharks under six feet out of 1,200 fatalities. I can find two under six feet, and one of them was a four-footer jumped into a life raft and bit a guy in the leg, and he died from those wounds. He would have been fine if he'd have been able to be helped in his, you know, and, or they had medical gear to help him out. Um, so smaller sharks, why are you, why are you even going to concern yourself with that? So. That's the thing with the larger sharks is that uh, they're, they're, they're not afraid to be hit. I guess we'll get into some trends now. Uh, some trends I've noticed that are kind of su surprising. Um, the first trend is that uh, the bull sharks. I just saw, I, I was glancing through comments real quick yesterday and I saw a comment that bull sharks, he was lucky it wasn't a bull shark because they won't stop. And uh, it's right now in our in our stats they don't stop very much i think it was 16 times they tried to eat the person on a 19 attack something crazy like that it's very high uh highest of the big three by far and uh but you get offshore so when you're surfing you're you're surfing you're swimming you're in you know six feet or less water you're much more likely to be a food item for those sharks than if you're out in the water. Um, out doing something else. I've seen uh, spear fishermen. Shark comes up, nice size shark. I mean, seven, eight, nine footers come up. One bite in the arm, leave. One bite in the leg, leave. And these weren't even kicked or hit. They just bit them once and left. Uh, there's a video that Shark Bites, uh, Christian over at Shark Bites, he did a reaction video to some attacks. And in that video, you can see about 30 yards down into the, at the seafloor, there's about a four foot, I think, bull shark down there. And as soon as it spots that guy filming it, it comes up like a bat out of hell. The guy had to shoot it in the mouth with his spear. But that wasn't coming up to eat him. That was coming up to get him out of his its area. That was a territorial attack coming, which I'm thinking that if you're out in deeper waters where they run into you where you're not in the shallows where they're feeding, you're more likely to get bitten just to have them bite you to get you out of their area. They just don't like seeing people and they're pretty mean. So uh, the fact that they don't, I've seen a couple of fatalities, uh, consumptions that they say are by bull sharks, but I question the one, um, William Colbert, I think his name is, he's a, a marine biologist from here in Michigan, Livonia, Michigan, if I remember correctly. And he went down to the Keys and he was at Alligator Reef and that's where uh, we mudballed. I don't know if I told that story where we were mudballing and I made a mess of the boat. I think I did. That's the spot where we fished for those yellowtail. And that's at the drop off. See, there's that shelf going there and that finally that drops off three, four miles offshore off of uh, the keys, it finally drops into deeper water. And if you watch the Oser chap, this is where these sharks stay as they go around. They stay at the drop off. And I think the reason why is because they're not gonna catch any fish or any animals. If they're swimming in the shallow water, then fishing things are gonna see them. They need that drop off to ambush food. So they're gonna hang out by there. And that's exactly where William Covert was taken. They said by a bull shark, but all they have is his gear and scratches on the stuff and little V cuts in it. You know, the metal where it scratched along it, it puts a little V in there. You can't tell what this, you can't tell me that you know that that was a bull shark and not a great white. And uh, the bull shark attacks there are usually not fatal. So I think that's a great white attack. And it's another one that they won't even consider because they want to keep saying that there's never been a great white attack um, in Florida waters when their own stats show that you know, Dr. MD or J.D. Morgan was down there and he was spear fishing and that thing took his spear and almost his thumb. So he was attacked by a great white right down there off of Key West, not too far off the shore. 
And uh, they want to keep saying that there's never been an attack by a great white on Florida waters. It's kind of funny because uh, I think William Colbert is a fatality and a consumption by a great white in Florida waters. And I also think that not Tamara McAllister, the other one, Wapnarski, Christy Wapnarski, I think she is also a great white uh, fatality. The way that she was lifted unnaturally high out of the water, what they explained, that is a great white. So, uh, you know, I don't see it in the other attacks. That's why. I'm just going by what I see in trends. So that's our trends on the bull shark. Uh, the tiger shark. This, the tiger shark is the least likely to feed on you of all the sharks of the big three. Um, they're not interested in it. They want your arm. They want a piece of you, but they don't want to eat you. Uh, you get a lot of these attacks down in over, I should say, in Hawaii, where the shark removes somebody's arm, like the one woman that she disappeared while she was out snorkeling with friends. They found her a little while later. She'd fallen into the middle of a coral bed, and all she was she was just missing her arm. Those tiger sharks. Uh, the gentleman that was sitting there fishing. He's fishing off his kayak, and then. Shark came up and bit his foot right off. I'm like scraping his leg all the way down, denuding the bone on the way. I mean, ugh. So uh, tiger sharks are, are bad because, you know, they're nonchalantly going to come up and take something from you. And very easily, uh, you do get a lot of territorial type attacks from them. But uh, a lot of times you lose things because how sharp those teeth are. Uh, but, you know, that's the shark that that one guy was boxing right there. I don't know if that was a I don't know if that was a Brazil one or not, but he was boxing a tiger shark and then you had that tiger shark that the guy was fighting it off with the butt end of his spear gun after he'd already been bit by it and he was shouting for his support boat for a half hour and he had to fend the shark off. No way. I mean swimming is too much work for me. Swimming you add fending off a shark. <laughs> not doing it. All right, so that's our trends for those two. And then uh, the great whites, uh, the trend I'm seeing is that test bites are very rare with, with, with great whites. The trend with the great whites I'm seeing is test bites are rare, but you know them when you hear of them. And you only hear of them with the great white. Uh, I have yet to hear somebody say this about a bull or a tiger. And that's the thing, everybody's saying, oh, they bite because they're curious. No, they don't. A bull shark bumps because it's curious, and a, and a, and a tiger's going to bite anything because it is curious. So they're right about the great white. They're right about the tiger. It's curious. It'll bite you just because it's curious. It could bite most things up on top of the water, pallets and things floating by. It's just going to bite them. It's curious. But bull sharks, no, <laughs> they're not curious like that. And uh, they don't test bite you, they bump you. I think they bump you to see if you're wood. You know, they're not going to waste their time biting on wood or steel. I think that bump is to see if there's some give. And if there's some give, look out, because it's not long after that that there's bite after the bump. So um, the test bite is only these guys. And so far, it's only monstrous of these guys. I think 13 foot is the is the smallest I've seen test bite somebody. Um, the one that test bit the guy before it went and bit Heather La, uh, um, Heather Heather's leg off after it bit her foot. Bit her foot, foot first, and that's how it held her under the water. And then it released her. I think it was going to readjust it to get higher up on the leg, and she was able to make it to the surface and grab the oar. And now the tug of war started. Um, but that was a test bite on that first guy, the bite to the leg, and the guy hit it and it let him go. I don't know whether the shark's teeth hit the bone right away. Um, it could be something like that to where it didn't like the bone ratio, and when it got a hold of Heather, it might have gotten a good part of the calf down there at the lower leg by the foot and decided, yeah, there's enough give there. I think the, the more you get closer to the gums, once those teeth get in and they hit you know, meat with gum, that's when they might go forward. So if they hit a bony area, you're in a better better position anyway. But the great white test bites are, people think that some, a buddy, they're down there, usually it's, it usually happens to divers, uh, snorkelers and divers, and they're down in the water and they think their buddy has them. One guy that I remember, he, he was, I don't know if, I think he was going down the rope going down the dive rope and all of a sudden he said he thought his buddy grabbed his leg 
but his legs started going off to the side and when he turned to look it was in the mouth of a like a 16 foot great white as it was slowly swimming by it's got his leg and now it's dragging him and he's the one I think that grabbed onto the gills and pulled on them and I think the gills is a good spot to go to once you end up on the side of a shark the gills is a very good spot your eye and your gills I think those are the two spots that might stop them um, when they're actually test biting like that to leave you alone. I don't know if hitting them in the snout would really stop a test bite like that, but the gills and the eyes definitely, I think, will. So, you know, they, people think they're their buddy. I, one of them grabbed him by the shoulder, he turns and looks, and there's a giant great white shark on his shoulder. I'm like, no. But that's the thing is the people think it's a buddy of theirs. And in that case, it's always a great white shark and it's always huge. <laughs> so um, they don't happen often. I think we've gone over about 10 of them out of about 200 of attacks that we've covered by great whites. So maybe a 5% um, uh, a five percent or so percentage on the, the amount of times that they actually do test bite. Uh, most of the bites are just going to be flat out angry territorial bites or out to feed bites which are the worst you can run into so that's our trends that we're noticing on these things and we got a couple more things to go over and then we'll end this um when i go through my stats this is going to get a lot more uh a lot deeper into this and i i had started a patreon i did cancel the patreon because I can't do anything for there that I can't put out here. I mean, I want people to know what I know. I want people to know what these sharks do and make up their own minds. I'm not telling you to agree with me. That's why I say this is what I think. I, I'm not going to say that what you think is wrong. I'm going to tell you that this is what I think, so we disagree. Okay, before we get into the end of the show, I got a couple other things that I want to discuss real quick. Um, first of them is uh, feeding of sharks. We, we, we covered the cluster attacks over at Sharm El Sheikh and people brought up that the, the oceanic white tips that they feed them and that they came and they, you know, two of the, two of the three or four victims of the oceanic white tips, I think it's four, but it might be three, but two of them had bites to their hand, their, their arm and their buttocks. Uh, the third one did not. So that's two out of three that had those bites. People were saying, well, you know, they're hand feeding the sharks and the people keep the shirt, keep the food behind them and they pull it out and that's why they're being bitten in their hand and, and they're behind. Okay, there's a problem here. There's a problem here and, and GSAF, uh, we're, we're going to call them out on this, but I'm sure other experts are out there spouting off about this without actually thinking. They think we're all stupid. Um, and this one breaks my brain. That's how bad this is. And you'll, you'll realize it as soon as I say this. So these people that tell me that as soon as a person puts on a wetsuit, we look like a seal. These sharks, even these smart guys here, think we're seals as soon as we put on a wetsuit. Now, the divers there that feed these sharks are in wetsuits. Why are they not going and attacking seals? Why are they going to attack people that are not in suits? None of the people on that beach were, were in a suit. None of them were in a wetsuit. Most of them were in bikinis or just shorts. Everybody that feeds those sharks is in a wetsuit. So this guy can't tell that we're what we are once we put on that wetsuit. But oceanic white tips because they're fed by people in wetsuits, know that the people that they ran into in a totally different area without the smell of fish in a totally different scene are what was feeding them over there. Which one is it? Do they think we're seals? Do they know that we're not seals and we're what feeding them miles away? They get it both ways, see, because nobody questions the experts and uh, nobody sees me, so <laughs> they get away with it. Uh, so that's that with the, with the feeding of the sharks. There's just a huge problem. And the whole problem I have with the whole excuses of that, first of all, both people were bitten multiple times that were bitten in the arm and the buttocks. They were, and the other thing is, is I saw, uh, he's a, I don't know what he, this guy does, but he was diving and I forget what, maybe it was in one of my books. I got to read again because he was, he said that he had one of those oceanic white tips come up to him and he says it kept attacking him, but it was swimming circles like around to the left, to his left or something. So I don't know if it was going, maybe it's like counterclockwise. 
but it kept swimming around him, biting at him. He had to keep fending it off in a circle as it kept swimming around it, it kept trying to bite at him. And maybe that's the MO of one of those sharks when they're biting on people is they're gonna swim around them, keep them off balance and try to get a good bite in somewhere. In which case, you're gonna have bites on the arm, on the legs, on the buttocks, you're gonna have bites everywhere. Uh, the second problem I have with, with the Charmel Shake explanation is what about all the other years? I mean, this is just 2010. People said that they dumped some, some uh, carcasses out in the water. Well, um, it seems that they've been throwing carcasses in the water all the time there, not just off of boats, off of the land. And uh, if that's the case, what's the explanation for no shark attacks at the other times? So if, if the explanation of feeding the sharks or do any other thing. It wouldn't have been 2010 and then you have that calming again. Uh, it's, it's a sporadic event. Yeah, Long Island, what caused those? The five or six that were a couple of years ago and I think they have them going on again now. Um, they're, they're not gonna come up with an excuse for that. That's why I have a problem with people saying fish, somebody fishing from the side of the dock caused, provoked an attack, bullshit. I mean, sharks are there anyway. So what about all the shark attacks when the fishermen ain't there? Quit trying to explain away sharks' behavior. Sharks are sharks. It sharks happen. So now we'll finish this off with shark attacks are rare. Yes, they are. Shark attacks by numbers are very, very rare. Shark attacks by ge geography are the exact opposite. The ocean takes up two thirds water takes up two thirds of the planet. Which means that the, these sharks, that they say there are only 4,500 sharks, <laughs> which is just of these, 4,500 of these, there's only 4,500 of them, but they're always in the shallows biting on surfers. Um, the ocean really is huge. If you really, if you took Google Earth and you marked a line one, one mile out, mark a line one mile out all the way around these continents and then you pull back you aren't gonna be able to see that line. <laughs> There's no space in between that line and the shore. I wanted to do a video and show you that, but it won't, it disappears. You can't even see the line, it's so little of a space. Which means that when you go in the water, because most people that are attacked are attacked within 200 yards of the shore. That's like putting your toe into a forest and having a problem of bears once in a while coming and eating you, or being attacked you know, once a week, just putting your foot inside of the woods. That's what's happening with the water because of, because of how it's so big. And if there are so few sharks, then there's a problem where we're sharing the same waters with the same sharks all the time. So they're making excuses about something that's gonna keep happening as long as people keep going into that water. Stay out of the water. It isn't worth it. Uh, you can't have a company build you a, a surfing like machine where you don't have to have these big buses in there with teeth. <laughs> it makes no sense. So uh, yes, yeah, shark attacks by number are rare. Shark attacks by number of sharks and geography, the opposite. They shouldn't be happening as much as they do if there's so few sharks and so much water. There's, there, something's up there. So we know how the, the number of the, the, the amount of water is there. That means there's probably more sharks than they're saying. And uh, unfortunately, they hang out where we hang out, and usually at the times where we hang out. Uh, the good thing is, is they don't ha seem to hang out chasing bait fish over there off New Smyrna Beach in Florida. And that's little sharks that aren't going to do much damage to you. You're going to have to go and get stitches and probably do some rehab. But you're not going to lose arms and legs to these sharks. It's very rare, I think. Now, you can run into a bull shark there, a tiger shark there, and even a great white shark in any of these waters. And then all bets are off. But these little sharks that they call the shark attack capital of the world, I actually, in my mind, have spinners and black tips in with dogfish and not in with large sharks, even though we cover them when they're six feet and over. Okay, like I said, that was just, uh, just things that are on my mind about what I'm seeing and what I've heard about shark attacks. I've already went through and blasted the whole surfboard. Sharks think there are seals from underneath. I did that in an episode way back. Sharks usually can't even get underneath the boards and if sharks came up from underneath, they'd be biting both sides of the board just like they do a kayak because they can't bend their head forward. They don't come up underneath you and bend their head forward and bite your board. They're coming up from the side. But anyway, they think it's below because that's the pressure they're getting. The shark's in the water. It's below the board, so you're getting hit from below, but it's really from the side. 
Um, so that's it for that. Um, I wanted to go through all that, and now um, I'm going to head down to Georgia. I'm going to do some fishing, a uh, little boat fishing. We got a little John boat, a little 12 foot John boat my dad bought. And uh, we went to two lakes when we were down there. Um, we went to the first lake and uh, we fished, and we're fishing at this dock. And we're casting, you know, you're shooting the dock, which you're, so you're, you're taking and you're throwing your uh, slip bobber and your lure and you're getting it under the dock. And every time you get it under the dock, you got your, we were getting black crappie. Uh, nice ones, nine, 10 inch black crappie. So it was fun. Uh, the rest of the lake we couldn't find anything in, but under this one dock we were catching all these black crappies and off to the side of it I would catch decent sized bluegill. I think I caught three bluegill on the trip. But. So before we even get out there, we get the boat, we get it in the water, but heading out, there was a flat on the trailer. My dad had just bought the boat in the trailer. He says, yeah, I have a can of fix-a-flat. Put the fix-a-flat in the thing. So I shake up the can of fix-a-flat and I put it into the thing. It's got the button where you gotta hold the button down. I hate those. And uh, I think I fill it all the way and I put the can inside the boat and we head out. We get there and we get out on the water and we get into this middle area. There's two trees, so we wanna check the spot for any kind of fish that are trying to hide out by the trees, so we're gonna cast. So I cast a couple times, and on like the second cast, I could feel wobbliness, and I didn't think nothing of it. So on the last cast, as I'm on the backswing, now I can feel the wobbliness, and it hits me. Your reel isn't on right. It's a brand new reel, uh, uh, Cast King. I love those reels. And uh, close faced for my little lake fishing. And I go cast and I watch the reel is sitting right there for a minute, probably tangled up in the line, and then it falls down into the water. So I, I take it, I look at my dad. I'm like, what the hell? He says, so now I gotta sit there and take all the line. Wrap it around my hand so I can get it to where I can pull up the reel. So I pull up the reel and I have two rods, so I'm okay. I have a backup rod and I put that rod down next to me. So I'm done with that. So now we're fishing. We get over by that, by that dock and we're fishing by this dock. And now as we're throwing these things, you know, there's wood coming down the, the legs and stuff and they're on angles and you're pitching into these holes. Well, you get caught up. <laughs> in the wood so we're losing bobbers and everything so all the time we're going in there and we're bouncing off of the bouncing off the damn dock and we're grabbing our bobbers because you can't usually it's a slip bobber so you're not going to get your the rest of your line off of it like you might be able to if you use the old-fashioned ones and so we get our bobbers and we go back out and we usually go to the other spot and then we'd come back and then the fish would be there again and we'd catch them again so we get over to that spot and uh, we're fishing, but brand new boat and you know we, we thought we had everything all set, but we had a chair that sits about this high. It, it has clasps and it sits you that high up off the boat. And there's only this much distance between the water and the side of the boat anyway. And I, didn't, I wasn't comfortable up there. I kept almost falling out of the thing. So. Uh, we get over to that spot and I'm fishing and my dad, he has no place to tie off the damn, the damn rope for the anchor. So <laughs> he ties a loop at the end of the rope and puts it around his foot and throws it over the side and it holds us in place. Um, we're fishing for about a half hour and then he says, hey, here, and he hands me the rope. So. Um, I take the rope and I put it around my foot. I got the anchor out of the boat and we go and we get to another spot. But we end up turning around and coming back to our spot because we changed our minds. And I go to throw the anchor in. Now I got the rope around my leg and it's just a five pound anchor. And I toss this five pound anchor into the water. My right foot goes sliding off to the side. So it was kind of uncomfortable because, you know, your leg is kind of bending that way. But when it hit, it hit something. And when I looked down, I said to myself, why do I have shaving cream all over my foot? 
Then I look over at my tackle box and it's just covered in spray of white foam. And I look at my dad and I says, I just sprayed my foot in my tackle box with your damn sealant. The tire sealant was sitting there. And my foot was dragged over by the weight and somehow the edge of my my shoe you know they have a plastic guard around there to where you got to hold that button down it had to be a perfect shot to get there and to empty that can like that but i thought i had shaving cream all over my foot until i saw what was all over my tackle box it didn't ring what it was <laughs> so there you go there's my two stories now those are the two funny stories we have a non-funny story coming up right now not funny at all. Uh, we get done, and I told you about us going to the dock and bouncing off the dock when we're getting all these bobbers. We get done fishing, and we got to go back to the dock and get one more bobber. Mine stuck, and that's what ended fishing. I was like, "Fuck this, we're going." So <laughs> I was like, well, "That's it." So we we go over, and we, he gets me by the by the bobber. Now, like I said, I'm in this upper chair. I lean over and I almost fall out of the boat. I grab onto the side and there's an inch. There's about an inch between the water and me. Now there's gators in this water. I'm not really worried about it, but I'm like one inch from the water. He reaches over with his hand and grabs the dock and he says that what it was was had some give to it. Now, I don't know none of this at the time. I got my bobber and I sit up and I look at my dad. <laughs> And I'm like, what are all those dragonflies doing? <laughs> These things were huge. They were this big. It wasn't until I looked back over at the dock where he put his hand and saw the, the smushed nest that I knew that they were wasps. And then I saw the two little hangers down. Now, I'm sitting three feet from him, and they're all covering him, and they're not bothering me at all. I'm telling him he's got the he's got his his two motors, his trolling motor and his other motor. I'm telling him you got to get out of here, but he's too busy swatting them because he'd already been stung four times. He finally gets. I swear these things were three inches. I had never seen wasps that big. So we get away from there, and sure enough, he got stung in the lip. And that had his whole face swollen up for two days, three days, I think it was. But his whole face was swollen up from three days from the sting to his lip. He got stung in the arm, he got stung twice in the leg, and he got stung in the back, right along the edge of his uh, tank top. I'm like, oh my goodness. But I mean, these, <laughs> these things were not two feet from me and they didn't care about me at all. I told them, I says, I can't believe they didn't bother me. He says, well, you didn't grab the nest. <laughs> So bees are pretty, uh, wasps are pretty intelligent too, because they left me alone, thank goodness. Um, so yeah, I got out of there unscathed. We now have a can of wasp killer in case we go back to that lake. Uh, the one lake we went to, um, this is down in, down in Valdosta. And uh, the one lake we went to was Banks Lake. And it's a real shallow lake, but it's deeper than the other lake we went to. It's like seven feet at the deepest spot. These are swamps, they're, but they're lakes. Like, and you go, well, you go out there and there's all kinds of trees cut off. So your boat is smacking trees and the, and the motor is smacking trees the whole time. And it's like, what the hell? But I did, when we were launching, saw two tiny, two real small crocs because their head was like, head to snout, about that big. Uh, probably little two and a half, three footers. I saw those there. But the second time we went to the other lake, which is six foot, it's uh, at the deepest part and three feet of most of it. Um, we're going to the other area where I caught a bluegill at the one point and I said to my dad, is that a log out there? <laughs> and you look and the head to the snout is like this. And he says, no, I says, or is that a gator? He says, it looks like a gator. And it, just as he says that, it just sinks right into the water. So uh, there's some nice sized gators there, but uh, um, you know, we're out for our fish and I don't think they worry about fish. So. Uh, not a problem there. It's going to be a great time. I'm going to be back. Um, I got another cluster. I got the most famous cluster attack in history I'm going to do when I get back. And uh, that's going to be the start of next month. Um, I'm going to start doing my channel again. We're going to get back. I'm going to do that, that special. It's pretty much a special on the most uh, famous cluster attack. And then after that, we're going to get back into the attacks. Um, when I go down to the... Down to, uh, Valdosta, I'm bringing my laptop and my uh, attacks that we have covered and I'm going to update my spreadsheet and then I'm going to be able to go through and start getting analytics on this, start telling people different 
species at different locations and which sharks are most likely. We'll start getting into that real soon here. So uh, the show is just getting started. We were only 700 attacks in to at least 3,000. So uh, we're going to be here for years. I just want to be able to get it so that more people can see the show, which I will be working on. But until then, I always want you to know I uh, thank you all for watching and for still being here for those that, that are. Um, everybody that sends me everything, everybody that came down uh, to see me in the Keys, uh, all much appreciated. And uh, always remember, if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of those sharks than they are of you.